Uh, he went on to broader interests in, in uh, subjects including information theory, philosophy, uh, and uh, parts of biology. Uh, the best write-up I could find about him was the Discovery Institute write-up uh, on the web. Uh, mathematician and philosopher William A. Dembski, a senior fellow with the Discovery Institute, uh, has taught at Northwestern University, the University of Notre Dame, and uh, the University of Dallas. Done postdoctoral work in mathematics at MIT, physics at Chicago, and in uh, computer science at Princeton. He is a graduate of uh, the University of Illinois, of the uh, University of Chicago, uh, and uh, of Princeton. Uh, his fields include uh, mathematics, physics, and philosophy, uh, as well as theology. Uh, you're going to hear only a fraction of his interests today, but he's going to be talking about the creation of information in evolutionary search. Right. Okay. Uh, when uh, Leo, it's a pleasure to be back here. Uh, Leo was my advisor back in 87, 88, uh, along with uh, Patrick Billingsley. And um, a lot. Uh, it's a fun research group, so it's good, good to be here. Uh, the topic is actually conservation of information in evolutionary research. So I want to speak to that. Well, I said creation. <laughs> well, I get called. The, the I know I get called a creationist enough, so I really <laughs> try to make that uh, distinction when I can. Okay. Uh, so the work I'm going to describe is uh, work that I have done with the Evolutionary Informatics Lab. This is their website and. Key person there who runs the lab is uh, Robert Marx. Uh, he was for 25 years uh, on the faculty at University of Washington. Uh, his field is computational intelligence. He was one of the as it were, creators of that field, which includes evolutionary computing, neural networks, and fuzzy logic. Uh, and so he's been at Baylor for about 10 years. And we started collaborating about a decade ago, but it's, uh, really things really came to a head in about 2007. And then we've been uh, publishing. Uh, since about 2009 in this area. And so what I'm going to describe uh, is really, in this talk, uh, some of the theoretical work that came out of these three papers. So uh, this uh, conservation of information in search, measuring the cost of success, that was an IEEE publication. And the next paper, um, cost of the, the search for a search, uh, that was uh, with a Japanese journal on computational intelligence, and then this last one, uh, is uh, uh, extends really the results in this paper in the Uniform Case Code General case uh, that was a conference proceeding. So, anyway, uh, let's. Uh, what I would like to do is talk about uh, just go through the key words in that title. So let's start with information. Uh, what is information? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's we live in an information age, right? But the uh, the statement that I came across years ago, actually in a philosophy course, which to me really put it best, is the following quote from a philosopher at MIT, Robert Stallmaker. This was in his book, Inquiry, 1984. To learn something, to acquire information, is to rule out possibilities. To understand the information conveyed in a communication is to know what possibilities would be excluded by its truth. Okay? This, for me, has captured what's most crucial about information. Uh, so if you want a definition, here's how I would define it. Information is the realization of one possibility to the exclusion of others within a reference class of possibilities. And we'll say something. I want to round that out. But then I want to add, I mean, it's one thing to say, OK, this is what information is. But if you're going to do science, especially if you're going to be within the exact sciences, you're going to have to measure information. And how you measure information? Well, you measure it via probabilities. The smaller the probability, the greater the information. Now, Information theory adds to that. It takes the log, you know, usually does some logarithmic transformation of probabilities. Uh, it takes averages. That's uh, very common in communication theory when you look at those, what's called entropy. And then you can do other transformations as well with integrals and powers and things like that. But at its core, information is measured in probabilities. And so let me say something about that. Uh, but I, I, before I 
elaborate on that definition and also measurement, I want to give you another way of thinking about information as a decision. Okay? Decision and homicide, they're from the same Latin word. It comes from cater, cater to kill or slay or cut off. Okay? As just as a homicide kills somebody, a decision destroys options, rules out possibilities. So it's, it's a, and the reason I, I give this, I'm, I'm trying to massage your intuitions, but um, a decision is something active. Often when we think of information, we point to something, we say there's an item of information. And there's a sense in which we, items of information have validity, but information fundamentally, I think, is more of a verb than a noun. So let's see if I say this in my next slide. We think of information as a decision, then information becomes in the first instance a verb rather than now an act rather than an item. That's when we speak of an item of information, we need to keep in mind the act that produced it. Okay, let, let me give you some uh, examples. Okay, let's say it's, I tell you it's raining outside. Okay, what have I done? Uh, well, I've excluded that it's not raining outside, right? So I've actually given you some information. Uh, if I say it's raining outside or it's not raining outside, have I given you any information? Well, I haven't ruled anything out, right? But what is the reference class there? Well, it's the weather. It's the weather that's outside. Now, what if I put that in quotes? It's raining outside. Now it's a symbol string that's being communicated across a communication channel. In that case, the reference class is going to be other symbol strings that might be competing with it. Uh, in that case, it's raining outside or it's not raining outside, now that the quotes becomes another symbol string that could be put across a communication channel. It would actually contain more information because it's longer, it's more improbable, it's harder to reproduce this, uh, that same symbol string. So what constitutes information is going to be, in a sense, context dependent. The context is the reference class within which you're considering it. Okay? Uh, we can, uh, if I say it's raining outside, uh, what about measuring that probability? Well, if I say that in Chicago, uh, it rains here some, okay? Maybe it has a certain probability. But if I tell you in the Sahara Desert it's raining outside, uh, that's going to be much more improbable. There'll be much more information conveyed in that. Uh, so in terms of the measurement of information, this is how information theorists do it. Um, think of, for instance, a, a poker hand. Uh, if I tell you a pair, uh, this is a hand which has a pair, okay. uh, there, or two pairs. Okay, there are lots of different poker hands, about 2.5 million poker hands. But if I tell you Royal Flush, that narrows it down quite a bit. The range of possibilities becomes more constricted. It's like more improbable, and there's more information connected with it. Okay. So just doing some, some basics here, but this is at a more general level than you're going to be getting it usually in an information theory book, which tends to look at symbol strings and trying to get them reliably across a communication channel. Now, what is communication in that case? I define then communication as the coincidence or correlation of two acts or items of information. If you look at Shannon's original diagram in his The Mathematical Theory of Communication from 1949, you have basically a source and a receiver and then you'll have, there's some act of information here, which will then be mirrored in some way over there. Uh, we do this all the time. I mean, where we see this, this sort of uh, setup, uh, you know, if I'm sending an, an email communication out, there, there's gonna be some symbol strings on, from my keyboard, then that's gonna get encoded in a certain way. And then there are gonna be some transfer protocols that are gonna use error correction, that are gonna move it until it ends up at your computer. So, this process is happening several times. There will be multiple, if you will, acts of information that are going to be happening. Okay. So uh, it's, I, I add this. Shannon's, it's interesting to look at the history. Shannon's original concern in coming up with communication and information was about the transmission of intelligence. That's an exact quote phrase that he was working with. I think this is even in his uh, undergraduate. Okay, so we've, we've talked about information. Let's now look at that second key term, search. What is a search? I would say there's seven key components in search. We have a search space. Okay, that's, uh, we have a target. We're looking for something in that search space. There's an initialization. Where do we start off? 
there's a query limit. How many things candidates, how many things in the search space can we check out? There's query feedback. When we've checked out something, we've located some item, you know, what is it telling us about itself in terms of how it relates to the target? There's an update rule. Once we have queried something, what do we query next? And then finally, a stop criteria. Where do we stop? How do we know that we're good enough? Okay. Uh, so this is very general. So let me say something about the query limit, uh, because that's always going to be involved. The fact is, uh, even though there may be multiple universes, our own universe is very small, and there's not a whole lot that can happen in terms of queries. So best supercomputers now are operating in a petaflops, so 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16. Uh, they're less than 10 to the 18 seconds in a year. Uh, no research group that I know has ever operated for more than 10 to the 2 or 100 years. Uh, potential number of researchers seems to be bounded by 10 to the 10. So actually, those numbers that I've given go up to about to 10 to the 35. So M, for all practical purposes, is always going to be bounded by 10 to the 40. I think that's safe to say. Now, if you're unhappy with that, if you really are you know, a theory-based person, you want to think, well, what's, what's the absolute limit? Seth Lloyd, a quantum computational theorist at MIT, sets the absolute computational limit of the universe at 10 to the 120. That's the most computation that could ever be done. And presumably, a computation is going to be involved in any query in a search. So that's, that's the assumption that I'm making. So anyway, um, you know, especially if you're representing search in silico uh, with the sort of m to the 10 to the 40 is about the limit you know, uh, I think of anything that we're going to be looking at in, in our lifetime, even with Moore's Law and all of that. OK, so uh, these are the seven key components of search. Uh, there is a connection with information, obviously. In finding a target, a search produces information. You get to the target, you've ruled out things that are not in the target, find that you've realized one possibility to the exclusion of others. So searches produce information in the sense that I just described it. Uh, now let's add this next term, evolutionary. What does evolutionary, when we put it in front of search, add to the discussion? Well, I, I think it changes one key aspect here. Uh, whereas we were looking at some sort of query feedback, now that query <coughs> feedback takes the form of fitness. Okay? So how good is it? Um, query feedback can be quite general. Maybe that the query is uh, query feedback is nothing when we, uh, when we examine it. Or maybe the query feedback may just say, I'm in the target or I'm not in the target. Okay, so that would be very, uh, uh, very simple. Uh, the fitness is going to give some sort of range of values that ideally will identify how, how close am I to the target. Um, okay. Now, there are examples of evolutionary search. Um, there's the Dawkins Weasel example from his book, The Blind Watchmaker. That's the one I'm going to focus on here. And then there are various, what I would regard as embellishments of that, but I don't think there's anything fundamentally new in something like MSU's Aviva program, Thomas Ray's Tierra, Schneider's EV. Uh, but basically, what's, what's at the heart of these programs is these are computer programs that mimic, uh, report to mimic, Darwinian evolutionary processes. So, what are they supposed to show? Okay. Now this is interesting. This is a uh, if you look at the history of this field of evolutionary computing, and there's a reason why people wanted to do evolution in the computer, and it's because the computer would allow for evolution to be done uh, in real time, because you can't really see it in real time uh, in the wild. So uh, Nils Baricelli back in 1962, the Darwinian idea that evolution takes place. By random hereditary changes in selection has from the beginning been handicapped by the fact that no proper test has been found to decide whether such evolution is possible and how it will develop under controlled conditions. Uh, J.L. Crosby says substantially the same thing. In 67, Heinz Pagels, in a popular book in 1989, wrote, the only way to see evolution in action is to make computer models because in real time, these changes take eons and experiment is impossible. Now, there is, um, Lenski at uh, Michigan, who I think has run 30, 40,000 generations of E. coli, uh, which would probably correspond to about uh, a million or so years of primate evolution. Um, 
but I, I would say that he hasn't seen a whole lot of changes. That at the end of the game, E. coli are still E. coli. Uh, so if you're trying to see some sort of massive saltations, uh, I think what Frank's book is, 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 is still correct. Now, let's look at this. Uh, Could I ask you about something? Yeah. So, so the Times actually had a very interesting article very recently, just exactly about this point. Uh, and they, they, it was about a book that was written by Peter and Rosemary Grant, who okay. looked at finches. Mm -hmm. And the claim is that they actually did observe evolution on a 40-year time scale. They've been basically looking at the evolution of finches in the Galapagos Islands. So, yeah, I can mean, you speak to that? There, well, finch peak variation, uh, yes. I mean, it's, in this case, it was cyclic variation. You right. saw some. And there, there were some changes that Richard Lenski saw in the right. E. coli. But, uh, I think what's supposed to make evolution interesting is not how finch beaks vary, but how you get beaks in the first place, how you get birds in the first place. Okay, and that's the sort of evolution that I think uh, these uh, people who were talking about evolution in silico were, were thinking about, that we could really speed it up so we could see some of these big, impressive evolutionary changes. So small evolutionary changes don't bother you? question of bothering me, they're, they're there. They're, I mean, the, the evidence for them is clear. I think there's even evidence for large-scale evolutionary changes. The question of what is driving those changes, and for the Darwinian, it's natural selection. Uh, for non-Darwinians, those mechanisms seem insufficient. Leo, you're standing up. You're... I just uh, uh, put my back to shape. <laughs> oh, okay. You'll try to compete with the research. <laughs> Okay. Um, about uh, two plants growing together and the cells fusing, and you get a uh, merged genome, and out of that comes a new species. And that's actually the way we make new species in real time. So evolution can occur. There's a, a 1954, I believe, article in Scientific American called Cataclysmic <coughs> Evolution by Ledyard Stebbins, whose credentials as an evolutionist are impeccable. And it points out that hybridization can give you evolution within one or two generations. So, uh, it's true, but that, that happens only in plants. I and mean, I don't know of any case like that in animals. Uh, well, don't get into that. Okay, you've made the point. So let, me keep, let, me, let me keep still going. Because okay. it, 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 I still might argue, for example, in order to have two plants to, to mature, you have to have two plants and really don't come from. Just keep on going. You might have argued that. I might have argued otherwise. But anyway, <laughs> uh, you think, let, let's look at this example. Uh, and I don't know how many of you have read The Blind Watchmaker, but this is, this is an example that gets reworked countlessly, it seems, in um, uh, literature trying to justify the, the power of Darwinian processes to create uh, information. Underscore that word create because I think that's that's what's at issue. Is it really creating or is it shuffling about already existing information? That's where I want to go with this. But anyway, uh, let's let's look at this example from the vantage of search. Okay, I have these seven key components here, right? So what is what is this example? You're, what you're trying to do is take a random string of 28 letters and spaces. Okay, so that's the reference class. That's the search space. Letters and, and spaces. So I'll write 28. So 27 to the 28th power possibilities. Start out with a random sequence. Okay, that's the initialization. Uh, uh, but your target is this, uh, say this, um, he thinks it is like a weasel. This is a, a line from Shakespeare's Hamlet. Uh, you have a fitness that's going to measure how many letters correspond in a given sequence to that target sequence. So it's basically a Hamming metric. Um, you're going to have an update rule, which is going to say, take an existing sequence, and then uh, maybe co one possibility would be generate 50 offspring by some sort of random mutation process, and then take the one that's closest, okay, and that becomes your next one, so that becomes your, your update rule. Uh, stop criterion is, uh, you know, stop when you hit the, the target sequence, and then query limit is going to be whatever your computational resources allow. The thing is, with this setup, you're going to evolve to this uh, final, uh, to the target sequence uh, very, very quickly. Okay? So I'm just trying to give you a sense. All these components are there 
in this uh, in this um, example. The fitness function in this case is a unimodal uh, fitness where basically, you're, as I said, you're counting uh, distance uh, letter by letter from the target sequence. So for instance, here you have a score of 27 because you have a J where there should be a space. And once that J disappears, then you're actually there. Okay? So that's, uh, that's, that's the, uh, the example. I will talk about that a bit more. But, um, just, uh, and I, I'm throwing this in more perhaps as a digression, but there's a, a sort of a lunatic vitality to this, uh, to this example. And I keep seeing it in places, and people keep challenging me on the internet because I, I come back to this example as though this somehow misses something fundamental or that uh, it's, it's too simplified. But in fact, this example just keeps getting reworked. So most recently, and I'm uh, I'm grateful to a member in the audience here for pointing this out to me, Michael Yaris, in his 2010 book um, uh, on RNA worlds. Uh, the target phrase for him was nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. It was a popular book by Jeffrey Satinover, who was a quantum brain monkey to Will Shakespeare. Uh, Bernard Olaf Cooper's in, the in 1990, uh, his target phrase was evolution theory. He's an origin of life researcher. So this, ex this type of example, which you're evolving symbol strings to some target, keeps getting used in the evolutionary literature to justify biological evolution. Okay? Now that's, I think, where we want to go with this. So the question is, okay, evolutionary search, as I've described it to you, this is widely done. It's, uh, in some ways, I mean, it's part of computational intelligence in the sense of evolutionary computing, genetic algorithms, uh, even falls under operations research as some sort of optimization procedure. How does that compare to real life evolution? Okay. Now there are people who think that actually the computational case does provide justification for it happening in real life. So Robert Pennock, for instance, uh, who worked on this Avita program, uh, he says, I do scientific research on experimental evolution and evolutionary design using evolving computer programs, including work showing how evolutionary mechanisms can produce the kinds of complex features creationists say is impossible. My colleagues and I have demonstrated experimentally, that is in silico, that a Darwinian mechanism can discover irreducible complex systems. Now I think he's overstating things there and there's some details that I want to leave behind, but the, I think the, the thing to get from this is that he is using what's happening in computational evolutionary searches to justify biological evolution. Okay? Um, Ken Miller, in his 2008 book, Only a Theory, he's a biologist at Brown University, says, what's needed to drive biological evolution? That's the question he poses. Just three things, selection, replication, and mutation. Where the information comes from is, in fact, the selective process itself. <clears throat> so I would say this is actually the received view that the Darwinian mechanism is able to produce all these nifty things that we see, that all of this biological information can be handed over to the Darwinian mechanism, and there we go. Okay. Now, I want to address this claim from the vantage of this, what I'm calling conservation of information. But before I do that, I want to uh, create some doubts for you that this can be the whole story. Not by invoking anything like conservation of information, but by actually going back to somebody uh, at the time of Darwin who, uh, who was looking at the logic of induction and raised uh, a method of induction that, uh, that actually, uh, I think, undercuts this claim that the Darwinian mechanism can produce uh, biological information, can create biological information. And so this is Mill's method of difference. He formulated this in his System of Logic in 1843. It went through eight editions. The last edition was in 1882, so he's a contemporary Darwin. Mill's method of difference, I would put it to you, shows that the Darwinian mechanism by itself cannot generate biological information. Okay, so how does that work? Method of difference says to explain a difference in effects, you need to identify a difference in causes. So what does that mean? It's different. Common causes cannot explain differences in effects. So, uh, imagine, here's a difference in effect, slowed reflexes versus ordinary reflexes, okay? Watching television, combining them. Combing hair, eating candy, uh-oh, consuming alcohol, okay? Alcohol is the difference maker. One person consumed it, the other person didn't. 
okay? You could have people watching television you know, or not watching television. That's not going to make the difference. The difference maker is going to account for the slowed reflexes compared to the ordinary reflexes is consuming the alcohol. <coughs> now let's look at the Darwinian mechanism. We've got replication, heritability, random variation, natural selection. So all these basic components of the Darwinian mechanism. Now, when you run the Darwinian mechanism, if you are a Darwinist, then you would say in a cellular context, it's going to produce, you're going to see a lot of interesting evolution. But there are cases, for instance, uh, Saul Spiegelman had an, ex uh, an experiment back in the 60s in which he looked at polynucleotide synthesis, and he found that instead of, of these evolving polynucleotides becoming more, and com more complex and more interesting, in fact, they tended towards simplicity and where the replicators could replicate as quickly as possible. And what's, supposed to make in what's supposed to make evolution interesting is that we go from monad to man, right? It's not that we go from cave fish or cave fish that have working eyes to cave fish with eye nubs because in the case of use it or lose it, they've been in this dark environment and now they've lost it and now we only have these eye nubs to explain. I mean, that's evolution, but it's not interesting evolution, right? It's how you get those eyes in the first place, how you get the beaks in the first place, how you get the, how you get the birds. Uh, cellular automata, you can have cellular automata that follow Darwinian principles and never go anywhere. In artificial life, I think uh, they're, they're also examples. There. So you can have cases of interesting evolution or evolution that goes in a sim simplifying direction or goes nowhere with all these features. So if that's the case, if the Darwinian mechanism is common to cases, common to cases where you have interesting evolution and intro in evolution which is not going anywhere, then something else besides the Darwinian mechanism has to be involved. That's the logic. I mean, it seems to me. Uh, I mean, that should be uncontroversial. Now, but uh, Stuart Kaufman, a complexity theorist who is not Darwinian, but not an intelligent design guy like me, uh, he has seen this problem, okay? And uh, I think he puts it very well in his book, Investigations. He says, in the absence of any knowledge or constraint on the fitness landscape, on average, any search procedure is as good as any other. This is a no free lunch here, which actually really upset people, John Holland and the evolutionary algorithms community back in the 90s. I have a colleague who was there at one of the meetings when this, this happened. Uh, so you have, uh, this is a no free lunch result, but life uses mutation, recombination, and selection, all those things that Darwin looks to. These search procedures seem to be working quite well. Your typical batter butterfly has managed to get itself evolved and seems a rather impressive entity. If mutation, recombination, and selection only work well on certain kinds of fitness landscapes, yet most organisms are sexual and hence use recombination, and all organisms use mutation as a search mechanism, where did these well-wrought fitness landscapes come from such that evolution manages to produce the fancy stuff around us? And he says no one knows. Now, you know, when I pose this in a, to Darwinians, often they say, well, it's just the environment. That's where we get the fitness. Now, I'll, I'll revisit that. I think Kaufman has asked the right question here. It's a question that I think many people don't even see is a question. So let's go back. Seven key uh, components of our evolutionary search. The question then is, where is the information coming from? Now, when we do it in, this in a computational context, well, this is usually where, where it is. It's put there in the fitness. It's put the update here. Uh, my friend Bob Marks, he had a colleague at Boeing who would call himself a penalty function artist. Okay. Once he got the right penalty function, the optimization problem was solved. Well, what's a penalty function? That's just uh, basically an inverse of a fitness. Take a penalty roll of fitness. Uh, so that's, that's usually where it comes in. So uh, let's see. So where did, it, where did this information come in in this, he thinks it is like a weasel. Well, it came in obviously in setting up the fitness, so you have a unimodal fitness function that basically measures how close you are to this, he thinks it is like a weasel target phrase. Now you could have set a, a fitness for any other phrase. Okay. Could have been you know, gibberish, whatever, and you would have evolved there. So it was by choosing that fitness that he got it to evolve the way he did. Okay. By the way, there are about 10 to the 40 um, 
you know, 27 to 28, uh, so 10 to the 40 about uh, sequences of length 28 that are 20, uh, 27 possible characters. Uh, any idea how many unimodal amming distance fitness landscapes there are over that space? <laughs> it's about the same. It's 10 to the 40. For every, for every possible element there, you've got the unimodal fitness landscape. So what he's done is he said, you know, I've evolved this thing to that target sequence. You know, but what he hasn't told you is, I, in doing that, I had a, a fitness landscape that I carefully adapted. And so my search for this, this target phrase basically became the search for the right unimodal fitness landscape. So uh, as, uh, this is an expression. Paul Nelson is a good friend and colleague of mine. Uh, he gave, gave me this, which I've used over and over again. Uh, you know, it's filling one hole by digging another. You, know, you haven't really solved anything. OK. Now, uh, to really get to the, the heart of things, conservation of information. Okay, what is this, uh, you know, when we put conservation on, you know, what, what, what does that mean for us? And so, let me um, put up this next slide. This is probably you know, the most jam-packed slide in this, this talk. So let me, I want to make a distinction between what I would call improbable or probable events and improbable or probable searches. Uh, an improbable event is something that's just High improbability. Flip a coin a thousand, or flip a coin a thousand times, get a thousand things in a row. Highly improbable event. It could happen. Uh, if you believe in the multi-universe, there are universes where this is happening. Where if somebody like me is speaking, my doppelganger and flips a coin, and it takes the next hour, and you can see a, a thousand things in a row. Uh, probable improbable search. That's where. What is the probability that the search is successful? It's not so much asking whether it actually succeeds. It's not concerned with the result. It's concerned with the probability distribution associated with the search. Okay? And this is an important distinction uh, because so many intelligent design arguments look for discontinuity in the evolutionary process and when they look for highly <coughs> improbable events. It's not just the intelligent design people. If you read, for instance, Thomas Nagel's Mind and Cosmos, he's basically looking at probabilistic miracles, particularly at the origin of life, to undercut a materialistic understanding of biology. Okay? So he's looking to improbable events. That's what we do when we're looking for this, try to explain or try to find evidence for discontinuity. What I'm doing in this talk is saying, look, I'm, I'm willing to give you evolution, give you common ancestry, all of that. That's no problem. What I'm interested, though, in is the probability of success for a search. Okay? So how, yeah? What is the search? What, what are we searching for? Uh, it's whatever the target happens to be. Oh, so what's the target? Can I have an example of what a target is in evolution? I thought evolution is not theological. Well, I think that, that's what I would challenge. And I, actually, you're, you're jumping the gun because I, I'm going to address this a little bit later. I mean, somebody like Richard Dawkins will say that the problem with this, he thinks it is like a weasel example, is that it introduces, introduces a target, but really biology doesn't give us targets. But then he takes that back. I'll give you a quote from that later. But I would say that the, the target in biology is teleology. Biological systems are teleological systems, teleological agents, and that's, that's what they produce. That's what needs to be explained. So there is a, if you will, if you want to put it in terms of philosophy, there's a natural kind that becomes a target, and it is tele, teleological agents. In fact, one of my uh, good friends and colleagues also is here, James Barham. Uh, you may want to talk with him afterwards. But give me a moment because I'm going to uh, I'm going to speak to that because it's uh, it's it's going to come up in the computational context. It's never a problem. You're you're trying to solve something. Even the people who are doing writing these Avita and EV programs, uh, for instance, in Avita, if you saw that this is uh, this is an article in Nature back in 2003, where they were arguing that this program was evolving irreducibly complex systems. They were specifically trying to get Boolean operators of a certain complexity. That's what they were rewarding. Okay, that was their target. Okay, so this is in fact, I mean, what I'm just going to describe for you now is conservation of information in a theoretical light. But what we then do is we go and look at these actual evolving systems, usually in silico, and then show where the information is put in. As it were, we, we show, you know, we have the theory, and then we show how actually the theory applies to these specific cases. But 
G give me a moment, because uh, I, I know what you're asking. Uh, I mean, because this is commonly how evolution is built, that there is that it is supposed to be absent teleology. And in fact, I think what they do is they end up slipping it in. But, OK, so improbable search. Think of it this way. Um, you've got a disease, the two procedures you can take to get well. One has a uh, higher probability than the other of working. Maybe it's more expensive. Okay? Which procedure do you want to use? Well, you want to use the high probability one. Now, the actual outcomes may vary. Somebody who takes a, the, the low probability uh, procedure, it may, uh, it may be successful. You may get lucky. And the high probability one, you may be unlucky. Okay? But uh, the concern is, okay, is the search uh, how likely is the search to find the target? And that's what we're interested in in, uh, in science, right? I mean, getting lucky is not a good scientific explanation, typically, I would say, you know, where if you're doing a needle in the haystack problem to try to find that needle, which, what are you going to try to do? You're going to try to find a better search that's not going to make it a needle in the haystack. That's going to allow you with high probability to find it. And that's, in fact, what Dawkins does, right, with this. I mean, he thinks it is like a weasel. You have to try to evolve this by just randomly <coughs> shaking out Scrabble pieces. This number would not be 47. It would be 10 to the 40. That would be your waiting time on average to get to that target sequence. That's the, that becomes the waiting time. Waiting times and probabilities are interchangeable. Uh, so that would be your average waiting time to, to get there. But it's because he substitutes for a blind search, this Darwinian search, now he gets there much faster. But the question then is, well, what justifies him Substituting that search. I think what, what Dawkins in here, in a sense, I'm getting off my, my, my presentation, but time is, uh, is running, and I think this is a good place to, to come in with this. But what, what Dawkins does, essentially, is he says, look, there's this blind search. It's, you know, it's hopeless. It's needle in the haystack. You know, highly improbable search, okay? as opposed to high, improbable. Highly improbable search. So what I'm going to do is, this is why Darwin's so great, I'm going to give you a high probability search that's going to get you there. This. Okay? And then he says, see, Darwin has solved all our problems. Now, I think we have somebody on faculty here who has a blog, Why Evolution is True. Okay? I would say that probably should be retitled How Evolution is True, because the question, why evolution is true, why does this work so well? What did... What did Dawkins do to give us this search? You know, this Darwinian search is supposed to work, but why does it work? Because he infused it with information. That's why it works. Okay, so that's this is this is where I'm I'm going with this. Uh, okay, so distinction between probable or improbable events and probable improbable search. So what we can think then is a P search. Let's by this mean a search that has probability P of finding the target. Okay. Next, consider that a search can itself be an object of search. What did Dawkins do in his methinks it is like a weasel? He did a search for the search. He gave us a search that then, with high probability, found the target sequence he was after. Okay. This is something, by the way, I mean, uh, people in optimization do this. I mean, this is, uh, goes one, under one name is hyperheuristics. You're looking at heuristic searches, and then you're over the hyper, you know? It's how do you choose among the heuristics, okay? Well, if you're choosing among heuristics, you're doing a search for a search, okay? And we uh, abbreviate that S for S. So, and so conservation of information, which we usually abbreviate COI, this is probably the, uh, as, uh, for the purposes of this talk, going to be as clear a statement as we're going to get. So we'll state that if you have p less than q, okay, and you want to improve a p search to a q search, right? Where p, let's say, in the Dawkins weasel is going to be 1 in 10 to the 40, and now he's going to improve it to something like, well, if you, if you allow yourself uh, 50 or 60 queries, you know, you're going to, he's going to, it's going to, Q is going to be close to 1, requires a, so by that improvement is going to require a P over Q search for a Q search. Okay. So what you've done is the search for the search has become difficult. P, if P is very small and Q is large, P over Q is going to be pretty small. It's still going to be very small. Okay. So the search for the search becomes <coughs> difficult. The search for a good search becomes difficult. You think of Dawkins' weasel, you know, that unimodal 
distribution is one of many other unimodal distributions. Let me give you an example. Okay, we've got an Easter egg hunt, standard Easter egg. Got an Easter egg that's well hidden, but it's hidden in a huge field. Okay? Blind search is going to be highly unlikely to find you that Easter egg. So what you're going to want is a directed search, a search that's going to help you. So blind search would be in the form of sampling, or try maybe an exhaustive search, but you're not going to be able to exhaust things because your query limit is not going to allow you to exhaust the search space. So now you're going to do a directed search. What's a directed search look like? Well, you're walking along that field, somebody's telling you warm, warmer, cold, warmer, warmer, hot, you're burning up, there it is. Okay. Now what, that sort of direction, warm, warmer, hot, what is that? That's information. That's information that's going into the search. Uh, raises the question, who then, or where, where's that information source? Does that information source know where it is? Is it a search for that information source? Not, maybe not a search for the information source because the, search, the information source knows the answer, but the process, in this case me meandering about, is getting information. I am doing the search. Uh, let me give you another angle on conservation of information. Because I've described information as something that increases as probabilities go down. Usually you do a negative logarithmic transformation and then, the pro then you turn information into something that becomes additive and actually looks like much more like money and it's convenient. But let's continue to think of it probabilistically, but the fact is we do pay to increase probabilities all the time. If, I, uh, if I'm buying a, if I'm playing a lottery, the more lottery tickets I buy, the more likely I am to win. But, and this is in the case of a fair lottery, unlike the lotteries that the state runs, <laughs> um, you know, where everything that gets paid in gets paid out according to proper probabilistic principles, uh, by buying more tickets, I will increase my probability of winning the lottery, but have I increased my expected gain? The answer is going to be no. Okay. By, so I can increase, I can pay more to increase the probability of winning, but in the end, you know, I haven't gained anything. Conservation of information works like that. Let me give you, here's perhaps the simplest example where I can actually do the numbers for you. Y'all remember, let's make a deal with uh, Monty Hall. He's got three curtains. There's a prize behind one of the curtains. Let's say the prize is behind curtain one, okay? So what's the probability of, uh, so I'm, I'm gonna be doing this, this search, you know? I've got, you know? I've got one opportunity. That's my query limit, one, okay? So I'm gonna have one opportunity, so I've got a probability of one third to win this thing. But now, let's say that um, somebody comes to me and gives me a ticket. And it's one of these tickets. And these tickets, this ticket will say it's behind uh, curtain one. This one will say it's either behind one or two with equal probability, behind one and three with equal probability, likewise two and two. Okay? And this would say it's behind curtain two, and so on. The nine of these tickets possible these five together will increase my probability of getting to curtain one and thus winning the prize. Okay? Uh, but the thing is, there are five of, only five of these tickets. Uh, P in this case is one third, that's the original probability. I'm now trying to bump it up to one half, that's Q. P over Q is two thirds, but the actual probability of finding one of these tickets is less than that. And so it's five nights. It's actually the probability has gone down, which is, which is then less than Q over Q. And in fact, if you run, this is typical of these search for the search uh, situations. You know, each of these tickets, this one has probability one half, one half, one half, and this one has probability one. So if I happen to get this ticket, I'll have probability of one half of, of finding, of, of choosing uh, curtain one, but, it's also a one ninth probability of getting that ticket. So, you know, when you run the numbers, at the end of the day, by using these tickets, I'm no better off than I was originally. It still only have, there's still only a probability of one third of finding 
that curtain one, finding the prize there. Once one factors in, how did I limit myself to these tickets in the first place? Okay. Going from this whole space to this, that's information intensive. I've ruled out certain possibilities. That incurs an information cost. As I said, I think it's uh, five nights. Okay. So this is, it, it's just, it, it's really just an accounting thing. This is what conservation of information is. It's just saying, once you factor in the information that it takes to get the search, okay, get a search that has improved your probability of finding the original target, you haven't gained anything. And it's called conservation of information because it can actually, the, the problem can even get worse. So in this case, you've broken even. You're back to one third probability of getting that prize. But um, let's say that you limit yourself. You really want to improve your probability. You, think you want to guarantee that you get that prize with these tickets. Well, then you only have one ticket that's going to work for you, this one. This ticket, if you get this ticket, you're guaranteed to, say, uh, curtain one and then get the prize that's there. But this is one of nine possible <coughs> tickets. So once you factor that in, your probability of have, of being able to do a search for the search for this ticket, and then with this ticket, find the prize, it ends up being one night. So you've actually gone down. Because this is how conserva conservation of information, the reason it's called conservation of information is that conservation is the best you can do. That's you can break even. Oftentimes, with these search for the search spaces, they go exponential on you, and your probabilities of actually finding the target by going to uh, the, the search for the search ends up being worse than just doing a blind search on the original space. Uh, let me give you one last example, and then we can have um, uh, a, uh, and we can open this up for, for some questions. Another example: find find some buried treasure. You've got this huge island. Let's say, let's imagine it's, it's very very big, and that exhaustive search is impossible. Your query limit is, is, is very small, and you, there are only a few places you can check. So, how are you going to find the, the, uh, uh, the treasure that's buried on this island? Well, you go to a map room. Now, this map room, I think, is actually a bar in Cleveland, but um, it's, uh, let's imagine that it's a room with maps. And so, what you're going to do is you're going to find a map. It's got the X marking where that, that, uh, that treasure is. Okay. So what have you done is you've displaced the problem of finding the treasure to finding the map in the map room, which will then take you to the treasure. But how do you know that the map is the right map? And what if there are lots of maps? I mean, if you were at Rand McNally, right, and Rand McNally's treasure map place, every pla for every place where there is uh, an X marked, there'll be another map with another X marked. Okay? The problem of finding the right right finding the treasure on the island now becomes this place to finding a search for the search, finding the right map. And the problem is when you try to represent this mathematically, <coughs> the, the search for the search is much less tractable than the original search problem. This is a, this, I skipped over a few uh, slides, but these are actual theorems I mean, that we've, we've proven on conservation of information where you, 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 you represent the search for the search, and then you find that it's the, the problem of the information problem has actually intensified. Um, so let's, uh, I think with search for the search, searches are as real as the things being <coughs> searched. I think this is what I think the a Darwinist like Richard Dawkins fails to recognize, that by just handing us a Darwinian search, when it works, it works because it has been carefully crafted fine-tuned to work. Okay. That's where he backs off. Uh, let me just uh, finally um, speak to this question that came up about targets. Okay, because I, I had a correspondence with Dawkins. This goes back 14 years. because I've been playing with these ideas for a long time. Um, also challenging him on this, he thinks it is like a weasel example. And he wrote, he said, in real life, of course, the criterion for optimization is not an arbitrarily chosen distant target, which is the, he thinks it is like a weasel. But survival, which he wrote in all caps, it's as simple as that. This is non-arbitrary. Now, what is survival? In what context does survival happen? 
I would say biology does have targets. Actually, it's not that simple. The targets that biology presents us with are teleological systems or agents. If you will, the teleology of evolutionary research is to produce teleology. Ben Shapiro might refer to these systems as being their own natural genetic engineering. Uh, and I would say that even Dawkins makes a tacit admission that there are targets in biological evolution, because this is also from his blind watch mirror. Complicated things have some quality specifiable in advance that is highly unlikely to have been acquired by random chance alone. In the case of living things, that quality, the quality, the quality that is specified in advance is the ability to propagate genes of reproduction. Now, to talk about it, that's the right quality. I think there's a genetic reductionism here. But uh, it's still specified in advance. Okay, so there's a teleology that's, that's, that uh, I think he would even have to admit to. Um, let me give you one other statement of this conservation of information. To increase the probability of success of a search from P to Q requires a search for a search where this higher level search incurs an information cost of at least Q over Q. This means that the probability of finding a search with a probability of success Q is no more than P over Q, which in turn means that the probability of finding the original target by first finding the successful search and then applying that search is less than or equal to P. Okay, that's the search for the search required that there's an information cost limiting factor that when you haven't gained anything. I think that's, that's really the, the key. And this implies a regress, by the way, because now you can do a search for the search for the search, okay, and so on. And at every point, you haven't attenuated the probabilities. When you do, when you work everything out and do all the conditionalizations, now I've got this search, I've got this search for the search, when I do it, I can now get a search, and then with that search, I have a certain probability of finding the target. When you do that, and you can regress back as far as you want, the, the probabilities never get any better. Okay, if anything, the search problem, the, the search, the cost, the information cost, has, has either stayed constant, hence conservation, or it's become <coughs> worse, which then raises a question. <coughs> if evolutionary processes <coughs> evolutionary search is not able to create information displayed in linear systems, but merely redistribute already existing information. I think that's what conservation of information shows. What then is the ultimate source of that information? Okay. So I'll just leave it at that. So thank you, and I think we've got a few minutes for questions. Questions, comments? Well, uh, if the target is an empty set, I think you're, you know, the P and the Q objectively are never going to have, uh, well, this, this is not, I mean, it's going to have to be a search for something that actually exists. So that's, uh, so all these theorems presuppose that P and Q are positive and that you, and that Q is going to be bigger than P because you're trying to, I mean, P represents a needle in the haystack. Okay. And the needle is still real. Okay. It's not a non-existent point. So, uh, yeah. Um, so at the beginning, you told us what information was, and you said it's excluding possibilities. It, uh, that makes, against that makes the, sense. Against the reference and, class. And then you had, right. And then you had um, these evolutionary searches. And the, 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 um, the evolutionary ones, it wasn't clear where they excluded possibilities. Well, it's insofar as they're finding, I'm, I'm assuming that they are finding the targets they're after. Okay. Right? But, but they're not excluding everything, anything until they do find the target. Well, the, the, what they're doing is they're finding the targets. And when they, when they do, that is, information is produced. But there's also a, a tacit target, uh, not tacit, I mean, I make it explicit in these, these conservation of information theorems. When there's a search for the search, you're searching a search space and there's a target there. And what is the target there? Well, they are searches that with high probability, with probability at least Q, find the original target. So there's a higher level target that's adapted to these lower level targets. So it, it's, I mean, all of this is consistent and it is very, I mean, I'm not pulling a fast one in terms of information. I mean, information no. is being realized. 
when you find the target. Because you're, when you land in the target, you know, you're in the target, you've excluded the non-target. Again, so it, it works. Would you consider the fair paraphrase of what the argument is says in the positive sense, which is one, that all searches are physiological. You have to know the answer, what you're searching for. Uh, in the case of fitness, it's, it's reproductive. I like that. I think it's, but I, but I think, yeah, I'm sorry. Let me finish. And the, where conservation of information is important and having a successful search is that you conserve all the information you've already acquired about what makes that possible. You don't have to reinvent the cell or the, or the, or the body plan or something like that every time you evolve a new species. Um, I I'm find that congenial, although I think uh, it may be that life is also um, profligate and that we lose information, but that's okay because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still being, being realized. But when you say all these searches are teleological, that was the, your, your first point, I think that's absolutely right, although that is, I think, an implication of these ideas. It's not required. Uh, it's not that I'm coming to this and saying, I've got to find teleology and biology. It's rather that there are these just basic facts about search. When you represent it computationally, represent it theoretically, I guess I should say, because it's the, these ideas are more than computational. And most of the, the methods I use are measured theoretically by these functional analysis. Simply, but you have to have information about the answer. Not necessarily the exact answer itself, but certainly the nature of the answer. I think that's right, because I mean, the, the, the information that makes the search for the search work, we usually call that added information exogenous information. It's coming in, you know, it's, it's, and it's, it's that information, I mean, it's, it knows the answer. That's, that's why, you know, that, that's why, why it works. Dr. Cool. So, it, it's not like you laid out a framework that shows that any uh, computational uh, ability of modeling evolution, which presupposes the search to begin with, right? I want to computationally get the eye. You've already set your goal and you go, I will give you that maybe all those apply because you're setting up the target. But, so fine, computation, not great. But in terms of actual evolution and in the world around us, over 14 billion years, whatever it is, what have you, there is no target. This game to me that there is a target in that case. Um, my evolution wasn't aiming for the eye of the it's aiming for teleological systems, and there are a lot more ways to be dysfunctional or non-functional than to be functional. You know? And so it does seem to me... Uh, One of the issues is, what is the probability of getting something which is not an organism? How could you identify something which is not an organism? Not a virus is a hard concept. Um, I would say, I mean, I think I can turn it around in this way. I mean, I, I, think, I think you're wrong to say that it's just computational, because I think these, these models are stronger than that. It's not just, most of what we look at, when we, because we are looking at computer programs when we apply these ideas, but the, the actual mathematics is more general than computation. So give me that. I think it's a very general level of modeling search that we're doing. But I, I think I would turn it around. if that's not what's going on in evolution, then what is going on there? Because if, you, if these models don't apply, it seems to me then you don't have an exact science. You don't have anything with which to assess you know, how evolution is actually working. And I, I, you can't have it both ways, right? You can't have a Rob Pinnock or a Ken Miller who says, that's all that's involved. You know, I mean, Ken Miller, when I'm saying it's just natural selection, replication, uh, mutation, and that's it, I mean, he's writing that in the context of justifying Tom Schneider's EV program, okay? So if you want to say real-life evolution has nothing to do with what's going on there, then I think, I think you're mystery monitoring at that point. So unless these models, these are very general models. I mean, I would say, you know, at some, you know stochastic processes, do those, because that, that would fall into this. And that's, that's very general. So 
I would say either you don't have an exact science, uh, or these ideas do apply, in which case, then it raises the question of teleology for biology in a much more fundamental way. So I'm curious whether or not you'd be willing to apply your arguments to, um, not biology, but to um, astrophysics. So the, the creation of the first stars, um, planets, and so on. Because essentially the argument would go through equally well, uh, but I would say that most astrophysicists would uh, hugely disagree with the notion that, um, that you have conservation of information. And the, the reason being that uh, this has to do with the whole question of arrow of time <coughs> uh, is that um, uh, uh, the, the, the big mystery in astrophysics in some sense was always how do you create structure even though you would think that, uh, en that uh, entropy is always increasing. That's just a puzzle, right? And uh, there is an answer to that. I mean, pe people have thought deeply about that. So I'm just curious whether you, I mean, it seems to me your argument can be just, you know, you didn't have to worry about organisms who are evolving astrophysical systems. Why doesn't the argument apply to that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if it, I don't know enough about astrophysics. And it's simpler. To, it's simpler but, than but, the thing you're but, talking but about. But what's, what's, the, what's the search? What's the target? What's the, Stars. What's the blind search? Stars. And what, what is the alternative search? Because in, in these situations, we always have, there's a search that's, you know, there's a needle in the haystack search, which can't be doing what we're, what we're, what we're seeing, right? It can't, can't be accounting for success of the search. So there's some alternative. But isn't, isn't Leo's comment then, right, that, you know, what's a, not a virus, or what's not an organism, right? Well, I mean, I think when it comes to, Living, well, I mean, I think we can even leave aside. I'm giving you a simple system. Um, Look, you've um, given a cogent um, argument. Right. I think we'll go on. Okay. Uh, let our speaker think about it, write to you about his, his conclusion. Okay. okay. There is a question back there, aren't sure. I'm assuming it. Uh, I think uh, I'm really following what a lot of people are saying about it. I mean, they, they, and it's, it's a way of representing evolution. Now, if you want to say it's not a search, this comes again to the question of teleology, then what is it? Well, how, how, how do you model it then? Because, I mean, you know, the term evolutionary search, I mean, it has wide currency. Well, search is a very, very general phenomenon. So if it's not a search, uh, then what is it? I mean, because, I mean, you do have, I mean, there are evolutionary searches that use selection, use mutation, use all these Darwinian-like features. Uh, we represent them in silico. I mean, that was the great hope, right? So are you going to say that none of that computational work provides any evidence for biological evolution? Biological evolution is something completely different. If it's something completely different, well then what is it? And if it's not a search, tell me what it is and give me a model of it. You know? And I think, that, but if, if you're willing to go that far, I think basically you don't have a science, they don't have a theory. I think the ball is in the court of people who believe in evolution. They have to. Uh, deal with these questions. Uh, my uh, opinion is that Bill has made his case, and we should go home and think. So thank you, Bill. <laughs>